session with Sheila Jeffries, uh, Maureen O'Hara, and Dr. Heather Brunskill Evans, and thank you all for coming tonight or tuning in on the live stream. Uh, my name is Natasha Tart. I'm the board chair of the Women's Liberation Front, also known as WOLF, and I'm really happy to see all of you here tonight. This is great. Um, so over the last decade, transgender activists have successfully remade the legal, political, and social landscape around the globe. The language of biological sex has been replaced with the language of gender. Woman has become an identity that anyone can claim. And as a result, female-only private facilities, scholarships, activist groups, and community spaces, once accepted as necessary by even the most conservative sectors of our society, are suddenly considered outdated, bigoted, or even criminal. In the face of this audacious blowback against women's hard-earned gains, mainstream feminist and gay and lesbian organizations have been silent bystanders, and often some of the most willing and enthusiastic participants. It's poignant that just yesterday, gender identity activists succeeded in getting Vancouver Rape Relief's education program cut off from its grant from the city of Vancouver at the urging of trans-identified men. And it's a sad coincidence that yesterday, also, a millionaire board member of GLAAD and an advisor to the UK Labour Party, Anthony Watson, released a letter of support for gender identity politics that was signed by dozens of wealthy gay men, including many of the leading LGBT publishers, which implicitly compared those of us concerned with women's rights in the face of this onslaught to Nazis. What should we call a movement that's centered around and led by men that demonizes women's rape shelters and calls feminists Nazis. As many women have said on Twitter, Anthony Watson and his friends surely know what a woman is when they're looking to hire a surrogate mother. But for the purposes of granting us rights, they pretend that the word woman is without definition, if not impossible to accurately define. They know who has the children, and they know who to publicly insult as supposed man-haters. The gender identity movement is a declaration of the rights of men over women, but today we're here to declare the rights of women to liberation from this hierarchy and our rights to justice. Here tonight to talk about that are our panelists, Dr. Sheila Jeffries. She's been involved in women's liberation since 1973 in the UK and later Australia. She's been involved in campaigns around violence against women, pornography, prostitution, and lesbian feminist politics in particular. She taught sexual politics at the University of Melbourne for 25 years and is now retired to the UK. She's the author of 10 books, including Gender Hurts, a Feminist Analysis of the Politics of Transgenderism. And her most recent book is The Lesbian Revolution, Lesbian Feminism in the UK from 1970 to 1990. Maureen O'Hara is a feminist activist, lawyer, and legal academic in her practice as a lawyer. Maureen represented many women experiencing sex-based violence. Her political focus is campaigning against the sex trade and on protecting women's rights from the attempt to replace the category of sex with the idea of gender identity in law and policy. Dr. Heather Brenskill Evans is a philosopher and sociologist who, among other things, writes about transgender ideology and works to protect the rights of the child. Her latest book is the 2018 release, Transgender Children and Young People Born in Your Own Body with Professor Michelle Moore. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you. Some of you will have already been hearing me speak today, so thank you very much if you're actually at this talk as well. That's absolutely terrific. Um, what I'd like to do before I begin is just thank Wolf for uh, being uh, so supportive and, and setting this up for us today. I mean, it, it's fantastic because we really need it. We needed the opportunity to launch this declaration and they've given us this opportunity. So that's terrific, and especially in New York at the time of the CSW. I'd also like to thank the NGO Object from the UK that's been so supportive of this declaration and has been really promoting it around New York this week. So what I'm going to do is just give a, a, a general background to why the, the declaration was necessary, um, and my sisters are going to go into further detail about particular areas. So, what I'm going to do is basically introduce the declaration on the sex-based rights. The, the declaration is a response to the influence that the notion of rights based on gender identity has in the human rights arena. 
It argues that gender identity rights are in conflict with the human rights of women. And those who, who campaign for gender identity rights demand that men who claim to have a female gender identity should be included in the category of women. And what we say in the declaration, echoing the language of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, is that it is a form of discrimination against women to include men in the category of women. In fact, that would be The declaration also uh, calls for the recognition of rights for women based upon biological sex um, against <coughs> exploitation in the surrogacy industry, for instance. And these are, these are rights, it has to be said, which men who identify as women do not require, surprisingly enough. Um, it's, we, we've done the declaration because we think it's important to think internationally when dealing with the threat posed by men's cross-dressing activism which lies behind their, their demands for gender identity rights. And their cross-dressing activism is commonly called the transgender rights movement. There's a considerable and growing feminist resistance to this aspect of men's rights activism in individual countries at the moment, such as the UK, New Zealand, Canada, Australia. But the transgender rights movement is very well networked internationally, and they've been proactive in getting the rights that they seek into a number of human rights documents which are influential and being used to create a clash with the rights of women, particularly within countries, particularly national. There's a, a, a growing, powerful international men's sexual rights movement supporting tra transgender rights and the idea of transgender rights. It features powerful individual and corporate donors, a range of very influential human rights organizations, many of which are dedicated entirely to trans rights internationally. And it's important to remember that, to recognize that these organizations are tremendously well funded, tremendously well organized, they have workers. There is not a single organization, a feminist organization with funding or workers that's actually in a position to try and challenge what is going on now. So there is absolutely a, a, an inequality of power in this discussion. Um, the, the, an outstanding element of the transgender human rights campaign, which distinguishes it really clearly from other rights campaigns, is the extraordinary level of aggression and hostility that its activists show towards those generally women and feminists who criticize the campaign. The hostile tactics include doxing women, seeking to get them sacked, seeking to destroy their reputations, preventing women from meeting to discuss the issue by threatening venues, by actual physical violence, or by intimidating threats, often made by men in ballot harbors. They include a litany of threats and abuse online towards any critics. And it should not have to be said that other rights movements to which they compare themselves, such as the gay liberation movement, never behaved like this. There were no threats. There was no physical violence. None of that occurred. And of course, the women's liberation movement never behaved like this. That fact alone should cause us to be extremely cynical about what is happening here. This uh, behavior has created until recently a vacuum where the proper interrogation and comment on transgender politics should be, because critics have been quite justifiably afraid. The transgender rights movement is overwhelmingly a men's movement. There are women who are transgender, but they do so for very different reasons. And they're not involved in any of the aggression that is taking place against women and feminism and seeking to overturn women's rights. There's a definitely a men's rights movement. We hope that the Declaration will create a framework internationally for women to resist this form of erosion of our rights and fight back to defend them. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how women's rights are framed in CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and how in UN understandings the difference between sex and gender is set out so we can see clearly what's happening here in this clash of rights. Women's rights as human rights are based upon sex, not gender. And interestingly enough, CEDAW 
um, came into force in 1979, before the language generally of gender had replaced that of sex. Feminists were still talking about women as a sex class, about sex roles, and so on in 1979. We hadn't lost that language. So this, the CEDAW is based upon sex. Article 1 of CEDAW states, the discrimination against women is any distinction, inclusion or restriction made on the basis of sex. Really, really clear. As the, um, the, the replacement of the category of sex, which is biological, with the language of gender, which is socially constructed out of women's inequality, makes the protection of women's rights increasingly difficult. This enables the increasing acceptability of the idea that a right can exist of the protection of gender identity. The women's rights are, are on the basis of sex, and sex is defined as relating to biological characteristics in UN understanding. So it's quite clear. Um, the UN Gender Equality Glossary says that sex is the physical and biological characteristics that distinguish males and females, characteristics which, as we know, cannot change. Gender is very different. Gender is the product and the mechanism that maintains the oppression of women, and it relates to the behavior that's enforced upon people based upon their biological sex, femininity for women and masculinity for men. Now, the gender, UN Gender Equality Glossary is clear about that, too. It says gender refers to the roles, behaviours, activities and attributes that a given society at a given time considers appropriate for men and women. And that these attributes, opportunities and relationships are socially constructed and are learned through socialisation processes. So that's the understanding that's in there in terms of, uh, around human rights at the UN. Uh, that doesn't really fit with gender identity. There is no space for gender identity in here. How can you have an identity which is the roles and practices that are socially constructed and learned through socialization? Well, you can't. It doesn't make any sense. So these things are in culture. In feminist theory and practice, the term gender means something very different from sex. It means the same as what were once called sex stereotypes. And in fact, CEDAW uses the language of sex stereotypes, not the gender. Um, it's uh, and it, it says that the sex stereotypes are the enforced traditions that maintain women's subordination. For instance, quote, that the state's party should take, uh, modify the social and cultural patterns of the conduct of men and women with a view to achieving the elimination of prejudices and customary and all other practices based on the idea of the inferiority and superiority of either of the sexes or a stereotyped roles for men and women. So CEDAW says we have to get rid of sex stereotypes. Sex stereotypes is gender. So there is quite a bit of support for the position we're taking here that's actually in the, the main women's human rights document. So gender or sex stereotypes is something to be abolished rather than endowed with rights. This creates a direct clash between the rights that the largely male transgender activists are demanding and the rights of women. Now, the idea that gender is innate, which is promoted by the transgender activists and that they can have it, all, uh, they can have somehow the wrong gender identity, it, the, the idea of gender implies that women have special qualities that result from their biology, qualities that conveniently make them behave as members of an oppressed class. Uh, for instance, women are supposed, based on gender, to defer to men, to do the housework and the childcare, to sit with their knees together and not take up space to wear clothing that excites men, that reveals the body, that is tight and uncomfortable, shoes that cripple and mean women cannot walk with dignity. Um, the gender specifies how persons occupying the different positions in a hierarchy of power should behave. Um, it, the, it means that uh, persons um, doing gender are behaving actually in terms of having power or, have, or being power. So gender identity then means identifying with a particular role in a system of oppression. You've got to understand there are politics here and get away from the woo, which suggests there's something strange floating around in people's heads. There is a politics underneath all of that. Um, it's not natural or biological. The notion of gender identity makes gender, i.e. the behaviors of a system of oppression, into something natural and inevitable. It eradicates the five decade feminist struggle to eradicate gender. Uh, which some of us here have been involved in for a long time. 
Now, I'm going to, to say a bit about the origins of gender identity, and forgive me, because some of you here will have heard me talk about this before. So I shall not linger upon it, but I do need to say something about where it comes from, because there are some here who may not have heard me speaking about that. Now, to understand why there is a campaign for gender identity rights now, it's useful to look back and see where the idea of gender identity came from. It's an invention of the last part of the 20th century. It was adopted in the struggle for respectability and social acceptance of men with a sexual interest in wearing the women's clothes, who were previously called transvestites. These men were called transvestites if they crossed breast occasionally, but they were called transsexuals if they did so in a more permanent way. And their interest was recognized by sexologists or scientists sex to be a paraphilia, once called a sexual perversion. The term more usually used today to describe this sexual interest is autogynophilia, love of the women and themselves. And the sexual motivation is concealed in most discussion of this problem. Transgender rights campaigners seek to normalize their interest by representing it as an innate condition in which they have something called gender dysphoria, which can only be assuaged by transitioning to the opposite. The much smaller number of women who cross-dressed historically were seen by the scientists of sex as simply lesbians. And nobody suggested it was about sexual interest in anything. So, but it was understood that they were just lesbians. Uh, the idea that there's such a thing as gender dysphoria is undermined by the fact that adult heterosexual women don't get it and are not involved in the campaign for rights. This is a men's sexual rights movement. And heterosexual women, is, if heterosexual women can't have gender dysphoria, then I think it's reasonable to assume that there is a problem with the very concept itself. You know, there's no equality here. Women are not in an equal position to have gender dysphoria. It's something that men have. Um, not that I'm a <coughs> egalitarian activist, it's fair to say. Now, women aren't sexually excited by men's underwear. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think I think that is generally the case. I mean, do protect me if I am wrong. <laughs> that was just a statement of facts. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the so what happened is that um, the the uh, transgender rights activists adopted in the 1990s, the language of gender, um, and the, the language of gender which became more and more, more commonly used in the international human rights field and the field of women's studies was a, was a serious problem. Adopting the language of gender was a very, very serious problem. It has led to absurd terms such as gender violence, for instance, instead of violence against women. It's a euphemism. It means it's, it, it's adopted by many people to avoid having to mention men. We avoid having to mention male violence against women. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. What is gender violence? Somebody wearing a dress, attacking somebody, um, I don't know, wearing boots. It doesn't really make any sense. Violence does not happen because people wear gender stereotype or sex stereotype clothing. So gender is a, a, an unfortunate euphemism, as is the idea of gender, um, gender equality, which you cannot have because gender is. Sorry, a gender is a hierarchy, and you can't have hierarchy equality. The words can't go together. So can we stop using any of those terms? We have to develop a language which actually allows us to speak about women as a sex and to speak about violence against us and to mention men. That is the clear language that we need, and we need to move towards it. Uh, queer and postmodern theory, of course, in the 1990s, uh, justified the idea that changing gender was something revolutionary and it was something uh, that if people wore the clothes of the opposite sex they were taking part in an attempt to overthrow perhaps even the patriarchy but the patriarchy did not notice now the the ambitions of these cross-dressers were um, well, they, they came together in groups on the internet in the 1990s and developed ambitions for rights, ambitions to get their rights into legal systems. And so in the US, in 1995, a group of men created something called the International Bill of Transgender Rights. And that was where the trouble began, really. Once that, that bill had been created, then there was the idea that they could campaign for their rights legally was um, set out. It was just a wish list as to how they would like their sexual fantasies to be accommodated and protected by the state. 
It had, of course, no standing in law and may have seemed outlandish to many at the time. I think probably a lot of people looked at this and thought, oh, don't be silly. But now, this is being very, very influential law and policy. The, in, the, those, uh, the um, International Bill of Transgender Rights became something, it, it was incorporated with gay rights into something called the Yogyakarta Principles in 2007, which were updated in 2017. These principles are about sexual orientation and gender identity. They're put together, and unfortunately, gender identity, the idea of men being able to express their sexual fantasies, was piggybacked onto lesbian and gay rights. And it was very important to have um, uh, principles on lesbian and gay rights. Not that they have much chance getting through the UN. Sorry? Yeah. The, the, the definition of gender identity in the Yogyakarta Principles replicates the template that the American cross-dressers created in the 1990s. The language is extremely similar. And the, remember, the bill in the 1990s was created by a man who was an occasional cross-dresser and advertised cross-dressing weekends where other men, men could go somewhere and dress up in scanties and whatever it was they wanted to do and a man who had actually um, transsex. So it's important to think, you know, where does all of this come from? Who are the originators? Now, the, the idea of gender that they have in the principles is, I think, very important to look at because that's the problem, that describes the problem that we have. They say gender identity is understood to refer to each person's deeply felt internal and individual experiences of gender which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth, including the personal sense of the body, which may involve, if freely chosen, modification of bodily appearance or function by medical, surgical or other means, and other expressions of gender, including dress, speech and mannerisms. In the Australian legislation, which came out in 2013, it included specifically mannerisms in how to recognise the rights of gender identity, and it said specifically it could include hair flicking. <laughs> because apparently women flick their hair. I haven't had hair long enough to flick for 50 years, so I don't know whether other women... Do women do hair flicking? Yes, yes. They do? You think they do? <laughs> I think it's a sort of... It's a flounce! It's a sort of... <laughs> it's an affectation. Well, these men think that hair flicking is something specifically feminine, and there are videos on the internet that teach them how to hair flick. So, um, it's... But these things are entering legislation. The idea that men should be able to hair flick because women do are entering legislation, and the working is actually going in there. Now, the other problems with their definition is it says everybody's got a gender. You know, each person's deeply felt internal individual experience of gender. My experience of gender is men's oppression of me as a woman. It's not that I've got something inside me. How many people here have got a gender? Stick your hand up if you've got one, please. You wouldn't dare, would you? At this point, you wouldn't dare. Say you've got one. But, but the fact is, uh, feminists do not believe in gender. And if you ask women if they've got a gender, they usually will look at you if, it, if you had some kind of funny term. But these men have placed into this pseudo-legal document this idea that everybody's got one. And they would see you presumably as heretics if you were to say, I haven't got one. No, thank you. Right? And in fact, when there are forms that say gender, because they say gender instead of sex these days, I always say, no, thank you. <laughs> now, I just say, no, thank you. They're offering me gender and I refuse it. <laughs> now, um, the... The principles are not a UN document, uh, but they have been influential over the next decade. They swiftly came to be seen as to represent best practice in policy terms, and they were referenced by governments as they were brought in legislation to enable men to self-identify as women, because they say, the, the principles say that, that there should be legislation allowing men to self-identify. That's gradually happening in countries around the world. Um, and there's been attempts to put, introduce it in, in Britain, but they are a bit delayed. The, if there's many uh, examples of the influence of the Yogyakarta principles and in fact the Human Rights Council set up um, a commissioner in 2016 to be responsible for SOGIs, that sexual orientation and gender identity, and so on and so on and so on. 
Soggy is quite a nice term, isn't it, really, for a soggy concept in human rights. Um, so the, um, I won't give you all of the examples, and I don't have, to, have time to do that, of how far this has come. All I will say is something about the confusion of gay and lesbian rights with transgender rights. This was a very, very clever ploy on the part of transgender rights campaigners to actually piggyback onto lesbian and gay rights. That means if lesbians and gays get rights, and golly, they need them, because you know, if we're thinking about corrective rape in South Africa and the murders of, of, of the lesbians and gays, even in, in America. So lesbian gays definitely need rights, and the UN has not up to this point been prepared to conceive that that is the case. But attaching it means that if lesbians and gays get any rights, men's rights to flounce about and flick their hair in spaces that have got women in are automatically also attached. And that's a very, very serious problem. Um, so that our declaration supports the sexual orientation rights outlined in the Yogyakarta principles completely. But the problem is it's now very difficult to separate those things off. It supports the rights of persons to dress and present themselves according to their choice. You know, men want to hair flick and wear dresses and, and so on. You know, they, uh, their rights as human beings should not therefore be um, um, restricted in that way. But it's unfortunate because of the, linkage, the, 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 the linkage that the uh, men's rights to sexual expression are linked. I'm not going to go into uh, talking about the effects of all of this um, in terms of what's happening as these men seek to enter particular spaces and impose their will at the moment. I'm going to allow Maureen and Heather to talk much more about that. Okay, so I'll leave it there and that's just an introduction and I'll hand over now to Maureen. Sex 
rather than their gender identity. And in combating violence against women and girls, it's particularly important that when women and girls report sexual offences or other offences committed against them, they can identify the sex of the person who's assaulted them and are not required to name that person as a woman when in fact they're a man. And that has happened in the courts in England. I'm not sure if it's happened here. Um, the UN Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls, which is closely linked to the CEDAW, and is also based on sex-based rights, has described violence against women as one of the crucial social mechanisms by which women are forced into a subordinate position compared with men. In other words, it identifies violence against women and girls as a tool of men's dominance and control, not as something random, not as an individual man losing control and attacking a woman, but as a strategy of dominance. And the World Health Organization has described violence against women as a global health problem of epidemic proportions because it is so widespread and so prevalent around the world. And that's equally true of violence against girls. Research published in 2013, based on international data by the World Health Organization, suggested that 35% of women worldwide had experienced physical and or sexual violence from a man. Many of them, in fact the majority, had experienced that violence from male partners or former partners. Men's violence against women is often lethal. The killing of women for reasons related to their sex, which we have come to call femicide, happens all over the world. It happens because women challenge men's authority, because they step outside of the roles that men have allocated to them, because they try to leave male partners. All of those killings relate to the subordinate status of women as compared to men. And a UN report published last year found that internationally, in one year, there were 87,000 recorded killings of women by men which they described in the report as femicide killings. The equivalent of six women being killed every hour. 82% of the killers of those women were their current or former male partners. And they were the women were killed because they challenged those men's authority in some way. Men's dominance over women is also enforced by violence against girls, often from a very early age. And a World Health Organization review of the prevalence of child sexual abuse internationally, published in 2011, which is the most recent international data they published, estimated that 20% of girls worldwide had been sexually abused in childhood and 8% of boys. For men's Sexual violence towards children is also directed at boys, as well as girls, but the majority of children who experience sexual abuse are girl children. And this report didn't explicitly address the question of the sex of the perpetrators. However, research which does address the question of which sex perpetrates sexual offences against children consistently finds that 90 plus percent of perpetrators are male. Often the figures are 93%, 97%. So child sexual abuse is overwhelmingly perpetrated by males internationally. The research that we have into violence against women and girls underestimates how prevalent it really is. The studies often don't include the experiences of very marginalized women and girls who aren't in a position to complete surveys and aren't in touch with services because they're so isolated. For example, women and children, and it's particularly girl children, who are trafficked into the sex trade are not in a position to come into contact with services, usually not while they're being trafficked, and they tend not to come into those research surveys. Equally, other women and children living in situations 
of what essentially is captivity involving very high levels of violence, often very extreme violence, don't come into contact with services either. And the figures that I've referred to don't include traditional harmful practices directed at girls, such as female genital mutilation, which is very much and very obviously based on our sex, on our biology. We don't know how prevalent violence against women and girls really is, but everything that we do know about it has come into the public domain because of the feminist movement. It would not have come into the public domain at all without feminism. The work of the uh, World Health Organization around violence against women and girls, the work of other UN organizations, the existence of the CEDAW, the existence of the UN Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women, none of those would have come into existence if the feminist movement had not first enabled women to name their experiences of men's violence. Our knowledge and understanding of violence against women and girls in its many forms grew from the work of the feminist organisations all over the world which set up rent support services, movements to establish shelters for women and children escaping domestic abuse, and other services and organisations working to combat men's violence and to support women and girls who have been, have been subjected to it. The organisations which set up those services were women-only organisations and groups. If those women had not been able to meet as women exclusively, then the feminist movement as we know it could not come into existence. In women-only groups, women began to realise that their experiences of child sexual abuse as children, their experiences of sexual violence as adults, their experience of domestic abuse and other violence were not unique to them, were not random. When women realised that these experiences were shared by large numbers of women and girls, they began to understand men's violence towards them as a tool of dominance and control. Women-only groups enabled women to name their experiences without feeling constrained or silenced by the presence of men. And that was crucial to the development of women's understanding about the nature of men's violence towards us. Women's ability to freely associate, to assemble, and to organise on the basis of our common experiences as a sex, without including men, however they identify, was crucial to the development of the feminist movement and is still crucial to the continuation of the feminist movement today. If any man can identify as a woman and insist on coming into women's political organisations and women's spaces, ultimately the feminist movement as we know it could potentially cease to exist. Our freedom to organise in women-only groups to defend our rights as a sex is now threatened by the demands that we include men who claim that they have a female gender identity in our political organisations and in our campaigns. Our right to define ourselves and our own physical boundaries is threatened by demands that we include men who claim to have a female gender identity in rape support services, women's shelters and so on. The presence of men in these services, whether as service users or service providers, undermines the role of those services in promoting the physical safety, the privacy and the dignity of women and girls, whose boundaries have already been violated by men's violence. It also makes women and girls vulnerable to violent men who, claim, who can gain access to single sex spaces and services by claiming to be women. And there are many examples of that, and most of you here will know some of them. One example was Christopher Hambrook, who in 2014 claimed to be a woman, called himself Jessica, and gained access to two women's shelters in Toronto. He, he already had convictions for rape and for sexual offences against children when he went into those shelters. While in the shelters, he sexually assaulted two women. He's now serving life imprisonments for his offences against women. 
where we're often told when we raise these examples that we're saying that all so-called trans women are violent predators. No, we're not saying that. I'm certainly not saying that. But what I am suggesting is that many of those men show exactly the same patterns of violence towards women and girls as other men. For example, last year, the Ministry of Justice for England and Wales identified 125 prisoners who claimed a female gender identity who were, who were serving long-term prison sentences. They were the only um, men in the prison system who claimed a female gender identity. It was this very specific group that they were looking at. 60 of those 100, 125 men had committed sexual offences. 27 had convictions for rape and 5 for attempted rape. Between the 60, they had 42 convictions for sexual offences against children, including sexual activity with a child, the use of child pornography, and the making of child pornography. It's only possible to make child pornography unless you make pornography in the form of drawings, which is not common, but if it's in the form of a film, you can only make it by abusing a child. In the US, there are men in prison, in the prison system, who are now IDing as women, who have committed femicide. One well-known example is Robert Kosilek, who calls himself Michelle, who murdered and almost decapitated his wife in Massachusetts in 1990. Since going to prison, he has been taking um, legal action against the prison authorities to try to um, make them pay for gender transition. And he hopes to be moved to a female prison if he succeeds with that. To date, he hasn't. But that could change, as I understand it, if the Equality Act, which is currently um, being discussed in this country, comes to pass. Men who've raped and sexually assaulted women are now demanding access to women's prisons, as in his case. Female prisoners have no choice about who they share cells with, or who they shower with, or who they share intimate personal spaces with. Prison authorities decide for them. And in 2018, in England, the prison service placed Karen White, a man who claimed a female gender identity in a women's prison while he was waiting to be tried on charges of rape and other sexual offences. And White already had convictions for sexual offences <laughs> against children. Nevertheless, the prison service placed him in a women's prison on the basis that he self-identified as a woman. He wasn't legally a woman under English law, but self-ID has been creeping in in practice in England and the rest of the UK for several years now. And at that point, it was the basis on which the prison service was working. While he was in prison, he sexually assaulted two women prisoners. And then he was later convicted for those assaults and also for the rapes which he was accused of when he was first sent to prison. Now, it should have been completely predictable to anybody who placed White in a female prison that he was likely to sexually assault women while he was there. But even if the prison services in the various countries which recognise uh, gender self-ID didn't place rapists and violent offenders in women's prisons and only placed men who hadn't committed those type of offences, Placing them in a women's prison would still amount to a boundary violation for the women in that prison. An intrusion into their privacy, into their dignity, and a lack of respect for those women. Who have no control over the circumstances that they're living in. And our declaration says that single sex spaces should be allocated on the basis of sex, and not gender identity. And that that should include specialised services for women and girls who've experienced male violence, such as rape support services, shelters, specialist health services, and also any other service in which single-sex provisions promote the physical safety, privacy, or dignity of women and girls, including prisons, 
hospital wards and other health services. Which brings me to the issue of compelled speech. In the UK, much of the media reporting of the Karen White case described White, even after he was convicted as a rapist, as she. Identifying violent males on the basis of their gender identity is now becoming common, not only in the media, but in the criminal justice systems of many countries. Article 4 of the UN Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women requires states to collect data relating to the prevalence of different forms of violence against women and relating to the effectiveness of measures designed to combat that violence. And that data should be recorded on the basis of sex. Recording men's sexual and violent offences as having been committed by women makes accurate collection of data about violence against women and girls impossible. And so it hinders the development of policies aimed at combating that violence. Our declaration therefore says that states should be required to record the identities of the perpetrators of violence against women and girls, and indeed any violence, on the basis of sex, and that this should include rec the recording of information by all public bodies, including the police, the prosecutors, and the courts. It also emphasizes that the rights of women and girls to access to justice should include the right to describe the sex of those who've perpetrated violence against them accurately, and that women should not be required to describe men who've assaulted them as she, when giving evidence at trials. This type of compelled speech is an infringement of the right to freedom of expression in any context. In a criminal justice context, the right to accurately describe the sex of those who've assaulted them is crucially important to the ability of women and girls to report violence in the first place and to give evidence against their abusers. In 2017, in London, a woman called Maria McLachlan was assaulted by a group of men who claimed to have a female gender identity while she was waiting to attend a meeting to discuss the implications for women of proposed reforms to the gender recognition legislation in the UK. Three of them assaulted her. One of her attackers, who goes by the name of Tara Wood, was convicted of assault by beating of Maria the following year. In court, the judge told Maria to call Wood she, or the defendant, as a matter of courtesy. She gave an interview to Feminist Currents in which she said she tried to do that because the judge had told her to, but she said she was nervous. She perceived Wood as a male because he looked like a male, he behaved like a male, he physically assaulted her, and she kept reverting to he. Which most women or girls in that situation would. The judge described this as bad grace on Maria's part, and said that although he could have awarded her financial compensation for the assault which had been perpetrated against her, he wasn't going to because of her bad grace in referring to her attacker, a biological and legal male, as he. If this kind of compelled speech is allowed to stand, women and children giving evidence against men who've raped them could be compelled to call their rapist she in the witness box, if those men claim a female gender identity. And given the number of men claiming a female gender identity who have a history of sexual violence, that is not beyond the bounds of possibility. At some point it will happen if this is not stopped. Criminal justice systems all over the world have histories of denying the realities of men's violence towards women and towards girls, and undermining women and girls who try to testify against their abusers. There have been reforms in some countries in relation to that in recent years, 
but it's still very difficult for women or girls to testify against men who've assaulted them. Compelling women and children to pretend that their rapists are women is another way of denying the reality of men's violence towards women and girls and undermining women's experiences and it also is a way ultimately of protecting women's abusers. We can only stop this if we reaffirm that the category of woman is based on sex and not gender identity and that men who claim that they have a female gender identity should not be allowed to become women in law. So this was my first indication of 
actually the seriousness of what was going on with children. I've learned so much since then. Um, I want to tell you the basis upon which children are now being transgendered in, in Western countries. And that is that uh, gender identity is somehow inherent, the argument goes, and it's, it's sex which is socially constructed. Now, this overturns everything that we've heard about today in UN documentation. Sex is a biological fact. It's bifurcated into two different sexes, male and female. All mammals are bifurcated into two sexes. And um, a gender, uh, we can think of as the social stereotypes in which we, we induct children into social mores and norms as they stand. And you can easily demonstrate that gender is historical because you can see that in different historical periods we, we perform gender differently. Um, so, you would think that within the medical profession that, that the medical profession would be in some sense immune to transgender politics. The shocking thing is that the medical profession isn't immune to it at all. I don't know about your country, but in uh, the UK, the medical profession is deeply embroiled with transgender lobby groups. Big money. For all sorts of complex reasons, they are embroiled with them. So, the, um, we have something in the UK which is called the Memorandum of Understanding. It's a very important uh, document that, that psychological societies, uh, the medical profession, uh, sign up to. And that is that we must affirm, we must affirm gender identity as something inherent in the person, not as a psychological issue, um, not as, um, uh, as we know about children and teenagers that they go through developmental stages. Sometimes they feel one thing, sometimes they feel another thing as they're progressing through the world. All of that psychological knowledge that we previously had about children has to be put to one side. And I know that there are clinicians working in the gender I uh, identity development services who say that their clinical training they have to put on a shelf because what they have to do, what they're actually compelled to do on the whole is to affirm any child who comes in and says I'm really a boy or I'm really a girl, I've been born in the wrong body because not to affirm it is allegedly to participate in conversion therapy, like the old conversion therapy in which gay people, this historical fact, that, that there was an attempt at a certain period of time to convert gay people to heterosexuality. So the transgender um, ideology has connected itself up to that wrongly, politically, ideologically, to say that any refutation of a child's identity, gender identity, is equivalent, any medical refutation of it, is equivalent to conversion therapy, which of course progressive people are horrified by. Um, and so they think that it must be correct if the medical profession are going along with this. It must really be the case that gender identity is somehow, somehow children are born in the wrong bodies. It becomes even more surreal because there's actually no evidence at all for being born in the wrong body. What does being, being born in the wrong body mean? It's usually, uh, there's a narrative then about um, pink brains and blue brains. But any neuroscientist, um, there, there is no neuroscientific evidence to demonstrate this. Actually, there's plenty of neuroscientific evidence. For example, 
You know, Gina Rippon has just written a wonderful book recently, Cordelia Fine has written about this. Cordelia Fine, about the fact that there, there are, the brains are indistinguishable. Brains are brains, they're no more sexed than our lungs or our hearts. Of course, the transgender community like to point out that, that there's a, a scientist called Baron Cohen who suggests that there are some differences between male and female brains, but, but even Baron Cohen won't go so far as to say there is a male brain and a female brain. On the whole, Baron Cohen is on the outside of a more of a more of a of a, uh, a more um, a position within neuroscientists that there there aren't differences between female and male brains. So we're actually transgendering our children, giving um, hormone blockers and cross-sex hormones to children, which have incredibly serious consequences of them on them medically and on their future lives in terms of sterility on the basis of no objective knowledge, none whatsoever. This is a political movement which has taken over. So, I first began to understand the depth of this political movement in that it's impossible to say that there is no such thing as a transgender child without invoking such vitriol and violence. It's quite staggering. So if I say something like the following, I understand that some children do identify as being in the wrong body. I do understand that some people are very uncomfortable with gender, their gender. Why would they not be? Why not? I think that gender, masculinity and femininity constrains boys and girls. But that's a very different thing from saying that there is such a thing as a child who is a girl is really a boy and vice versa. This has become such a populist understanding now that if you talk to the ordinary person in the street, the ordinary person in the street will say, oh yes, I do understand that, you know, that, um, about, um, you know, gender being socially constructed. Mm. Yes, but what about those children that really are born in the wrong body? It's very difficult to shift people from, from that view. So where does this leave us? This leaves us in a situation which, in my view, is breaching the human rights of the child. Shockingly, breaching the human rights of the child. So let us, let us go to some of the rights of the child have they been set out. So, in 1959, in the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, it was said that the child, by reason of his physical and mental immaturity, needs special safeguards and care, including appropriate legal protection. So I would like to invoke that back again in terms of protecting our children. Children need legal protection from this ideology. We are sacrificing our children to this ideology, including children cannot possibly consent to the medical interventions that they are undergoing. Firstly, the medical profession themselves openly admit that they don't know the long-term consequences of the drugs that are being given to children. That is absolutely a fact. They don't even attempt to hide that. The Gender Identity Development Services recognize a whole range of physical things that happen on the basis of ingesting uh, hormones at that age. So, we're asking children whether they can consent to something that the adults think is bad for them physically. We're also asking them to consent to the fantasy. Children believe that they can actually change sex. Nobody can change sex. 
It's absolutely impossible to change sex. We can simulate being the other sex if we want, but, and adults can do that as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's their right to do it. But children have no conception that if they take hormones, um, let's suggest if we talk about a girl child, let's take a girl child. She will never become a man. She may have the secondary sexual characteristics of a man, growth of, of, of beard and so on. She can have a mastectomy. She will never have a penis. That's the reality of it. I don't think children understand this. And why would they understand this? Because they seemingly have a lot of concerned and um, mature grown-ups going along with this story for them. The story that they get, as we heard today, from the detransitioners, from the web, from all kinds of different sources pushed at them constantly. The latest trendy thing, actually, I know that sounds like an insulting word, is to be transgender for a young person. So, and they certainly can't predict what they will feel like in 15 years' time about whether they want to be a parent or not. We're taking that choice away from them. Now, we all know that children go through developmental stages. We, we, we prevent children from... Uh, children apparently have to ask their parents' right to... Um, their parental permission to have a tattoo until they're 18. In every other area of the child's life, we try to give adult and parental oversight to steer them. In this one area, we say that the children self-identifying is what is going to lead us. We have to endorse and be behind the child in this. So, I want to go up to 1989 um, with the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child, Article 3, which says, in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institutions, courts of law, administrative authorities, or legislative bodies, the best interests of the child shall be the primary consideration. It's the best interests of the child is not what is being taken into consideration here. What is being taken into consideration is the sensibility of transgender adults, transgender lobby groups, transgender uh, or men who identify as women, who get the most exercised about questioning whether a child should have medical treatment or not. So I'm going to suggest to you that what we're doing is pandering not to the best interests of the child, but to the interests of a, a, of a, a social movement. And we should stand up to this social movement in order to protect our children Collectively, we need to protect our children from something which is becoming uh, contagious. Not just for the children themselves who are undergoing it, but for all children. In schools now, up and down the land in the UK, we have organisations that come into our schools and teach three and four year olds and upwards that if they like playing with certain toys or attracted to certain colours, like playing with certain, um, like playing with the girls, if they're boys, or vice versa, that they may be transgender. And I think this is a violation of the rights of the child to be left alone to its fantasy play, to its own development, and not to burden it with these terribly grown-up ideas about gender. Let our children be. So we can't say, it's just a minority of children that are actually being transgendered. All our children are being affected by this now.
whether they identify as transgender or not. So as far as I'm concerned, the best interests should include preventing organizations that promote the concept of gender identity or constituencies that have no clinical expertise or child psychology background from influencing the health services for children or the education system. And there's another part of Article 3 which I would like to talk about. It says, states should ensure that the institutions, services and facilities responsible for the care or protection of children shall conform with the standards established by competent authorities, particularly in the area of safety and health. It's an absolute scandal what is going on in the, trans, the medicalized, the attempt to medically transgender children. So, because to halt the natural processes of puberty is an intervention of momentous proportions with lifelong medical, psychological, and emotional implications. The practice should be curtailed until we are able to apply the same scientific rigor that is demanded of other medical interventions. In this instance, there was a complete lack of scientific rigor. Practices that medically modify children's bodies constitute a denial of the dignity and integrity of the individual child and a violation of the child's human rights and fundamental freedoms. It is the right of the child to the development of school curricula which are materially accurate about human biology and reproduction, which they aren't, because the, the uh, education that the children are getting overturns, as I said, um, this issue of biology, and they tell the children that biology, is, is their, their physical bodies, means very little in relation to their gender identity. Uh, they don't quite, they're not being told properly about reproduction. And um, children, the education that we give to children should include information about, obviously, the human rights of people of diverse sexual orientations, um, taking into account, in, taking into account the evolving capacity and psychological development stages of the child. But the things should be separated out, which are not separated out, that being um, understanding that some people are same-sex attracted and that some people are transgender are being conflated into an allegedly progressive approach to children. And they, those two things should be separated out from each other. Uh, we shouldn't allow organizations um, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are actually now beginning to be state-funded even to promote sex stereotyping and the concept of gender identity in educational institutions, as this constitutes the promotion of discrimination against women and girls. Girls now in schools, if they object to uh, sharing uh, physical private spaces with boys who identify as girls, the girls themselves are told that they have a problem that needs to be sorted out. The parents are told that there is something um, disturbed about the girl who won't accept that the boy is really a, a girl. So, to carry on, I think uh, this should be called a Declaration of Children's Sex-Based Rights, this part of our document. So, recent changes in the language of UN documentation strategies and actions which replicate the category of sex with gender ultimately risk undermining the protection of boys' and girls' human rights. And that is coming now into the documentation, into UN documentation. The term gender is being used rather than sex. Um, so some non-binding international documents claim that children have innate gender identities. This is emerging 
uh, the Yogi Carter principles that we've heard about have promoted this. Um, and they say that children's, uh, under Article 8 of the United Nations Convention of the Right of the Child, in which, they, in which it's, uh, it's stated that children have a right to national identity, the argument goes then from the trans lobby that children's gender identity is equivalent to having a national identity which should be protected. So we need to reaffirm uh, the need for the protection of the rights of the child as they are set out in the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child, which makes a distinction between sex and gender not explicitly in that sense, but in other UN documentations, it's clear that boy, that men and women um, are biological categories, so we can extrapolate from that that boys and girls are biological categories, and that gender is uh, the social context uh, of uh, norms and gender stereotyping. So, I'm going to come to an end now. I hope people will ask questions about this. I want to reaffirm the really, really serious thing that is going on with generations of children now. It has to stop. And I hope that the declaration of um, women's rights, um, including the declaration of children's rights, will go some way to helping other people formulate and reconceptualize what is going wrong with our institutions, our police forces, our schools, our hospitals. Because it's very difficult, if you use gender instead of sex, it's very difficult to challenge anything. It's extremely difficult. Conceptually, those two things have to be separated out and kept apart. Because gender identity is not a material phenomenon. It is a concept. It emerged into our culture. 20 years ago, we, it, the idea of the transgender child would have been unrecognizable to most parents. The child born in the wrong body, people wouldn't have understood it. The trans lobby has been extremely powerful. The rhetoric has got hold of the popular imagination such that now to actually say there isn't such a thing as a child born in the wrong body, sounds extremist, controversial, bizarre. And actually, it's the most sane and sensible position that we can take if we want to protect the rights of our children. And do you know what? To be the grown-ups, to steer our children, to get back into the driving seat of protecting the rights of all of our children. Thank you.
the live stream, the questioner was saying that uh, she has a young child going through this and that it's Orwellian the way the doctors and the schools are all uh, gender affirming that they've had three uh, trans identified uh, lifelong medical patients come to speak to the daughter's school, but no one who is critical of these ideas um, in even to the point where a uh, now former friend uh, got her daughter a binder and taught her how to hide it from her. And she's asking what, what to do next. Thank you. Do you know, it gets even more Orwellian because uh, many of the clinicians don't want to do this either. They really don't. So what is going on in our culture that even clinicians who have promised to first do no harm, do harm, know they're doing harm, but feel that they can't speak out either. It's really, it's really serious. Um, well, there's, how have we all got into a position where we're frightened to speak out about this? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a collective uh, question that we need to ask. Um, it will only be helped. I think two things are going to happen. More and more people are going to dare to speak out, which is fantastic. The fact that we're meeting here is, is uh, very significant, I think. And I think there's possibly going to be a sort of peak uh, moment in the culture. Uh, I hope so. Um, where just how serious this is is going to explode into public consciousness but this might not happen unless we get some scandals we're going to get some scandals in my view where the children and young people who have gone through transition then turn around and um, bring some legal cases against doctors and say how could this have happened how could the grown-ups have done this to me i wasn't able to consent. I didn't know what I was, uh, I didn't know what I was signing. None of it made any sense to me. I wanted to be transitioned in the moment. Um, but retrospectively, it was, it was an abuse of me. And I think that uh, that is probably possibly what is going to have to happen with regard to children before anything will change. I mean, there are various things going on in the UK at the moment which are um, heartening in terms of um, people challenging, parents challenging our gender identity development services and so on. And also clinicians beginning to be whistleblowers. So it, it feels a bit like a, bo a boil that's, like, uh, that's going to burst any moment. Um, so that, that would be a good thing, that would be great if it did. But I don't know where this leaves parents. Parents are in the most terrible position and and until you know because I've done research on parents too and people um, talk to parents and realise the seriousness of what is going on and people children are being taken away from them and put into social services in some instances because the parents won't go along with this. It's very serious for our just you know at the level of a, a liberal democracy, which is could possibly be happening. I, I'm, I have no comfort to give you, I'm sorry. I just know it, it's terrible. Absolutely terrible. Just kind of a piggyback comment. There's, I've heard stories of um, mostly women, maybe from Eastern Bloc countries, who are um, athletes given hormones and there's a great uh, sympathy for them and it isn't charged with that transsexual that's okay so it, you know maybe focusing on that and then realizing like hey this is kind of the same because these women have ended up with um, attributes they didn't want or, or um, sometimes paralyzed so it's just a piggyback thought of kind of coming from the other side and saying, you know, this is the same thing. <laughs>
simply ask a question about the declaration, because I don't know much about it. Is it a written document at present? Is, are there copies of it here? Can we get these copies? Heather is learning us. Can we get these copies? Or if not, they're not here, how can we get them? And what are the plans for using this declaration to uh, make the changes we want to make? Yes, the, the document exists. It's actually quite long, so it would have been difficult for us to bring copies for everybody to these meetings. It's online at the moment, and you can certainly access it. Can you just read it out? Yeah, yeah. Oh, very simple. www.womensdeclaration.com. No punctuation, no capitals. It's on the bottom of this flyer here. Yeah. Can I just say, it's also, we need as many signatures as possible for this declaration because none of, nothing is going to change unless there is a great force in the number of people who are coming out and asserting that we need to, we need to um, abandon this concept of gender identity and get back to sex and gender as a set of social stereotypes. So there's absolutely nothing progressive about transgender ideology and embeds the most, the most conservative of uh, gender stereotypes. You need a whole lot of people to sign this declaration. Go online and add your signature. That's, yeah, please do. And, and, and as to where we go from here, uh, for this year, we didn't have the declaration done in time to actually send it to the CEDAW committee and make them aware of what we're doing. <coughs> We obviously will do in future, and we are working out whether we can get to the, um, the, the CSW meetings in June uh, in Geneva. So there are many other occasions on which we should be able to present the document, give it to the committee, get it taken uh, seriously. We don't think it's necessarily going to be adopted as a UN document. I don't think that we think that's what's going to happen. But the hope is that it will actually provide strength to those women on the CEDAW committee and elsewhere in the human rights uh, networks to reject the gender identity ideas which are constantly being pushed. It will give them language, it will give them strength to be able to reject that. But certainly we want it to be much better known. We want lots of women to sign on to it, introduce it to their networks, get others in their countries to sign on to it and so on. Do you want to add it to CEDAW? Uh, I don't know that that would be possible. I, uh, we will, as we go forward, we are working with human rights lawyers to try and work out what we can do, how we can use it. I don't know at all whether that would be possible. I think it might be difficult to get something in which is actually against something happening rather than something which is for something. So I'm not quite sure how that will go, but we will be advised and see how far we can take it. Um, as well as that, I think the even if it's not adopted, the more we can put it forward in the UN and with the UN bodies and uh, the CEDAW bodies, the more influential we're hoping it can be. And in, in, in challenging um, gender ideologies, there isn't anything out there that's actively challenging it at the minute. But also, we're going to do a summary of it. It's quite a long document and, it, and it's, it, it's written in a format you know, of um, declarations and, and, and UN conventions. We're going to do a summary which is more, will be more accessible and we're hoping that that would be useful to women to use as a political tool in campaigning work uh, in various ways and it, it will be a summary of all the various ideas and the different aspects of the sex-based based rights that are contained in the larger declaration and it, it could be used in all sorts of different ways we hope by feminist campaigners. Um, to put across the ideas in, in, in different contexts. So it has a section on children, it has a section on violence against women, it has a section on uh, women's political participation um, in public life. It has different sections um, about different sports. aspects. Yeah, yeah, women's sports. And so you, know, you, can, you can use all of it together or you can use particular sections if you've got, if you're doing a, uh, involved in a campaign around one of the particular issues that the, the, the declaration relates to. So we're hoping it can be used in a lot of different ways. Yes, and I'm hoping that when there are council meetings about policy in some town, wherever it is, and somebody is saying, 
or we must consider the Yogyakarta Carter principles, they say this, so we must get that wording into our policy for Timbuktu or whatever. That somebody else sitting next to them will say, actually, do you know there's another document called the Declaration on Women's Sex Based Rights that maybe we should consider as well, which actually is very much the opposite of what you're suggesting. So that's what we'd like, that women everywhere involved in the creation of policy are aware of this and able to use the language. Yeah. And when, when they say that, if they can say it's been signed by 50,000 people around the world, that will add power to our elbows because there's nothing else that will. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I'm from Munchi, New Zealand's feminist magazine. It's not a great day for New Zealand today, but um, I'm here. Um, uh, I, I just discovered accidentally that this self-ID was an issue last August. And it seems as though um, just about every feminist of my generation didn't go into that sort of proposal before the New Zealand Parliament for trans people to be able to fill out a form and just declare that their birth certificate should now say whatever sex they wanted to. And of course, there's the same proposal in front of UK Parliament, and we have got a lot of support um, from A Women's Place and Fair Play for Women, but the way we've been attacked up and down relentlessly um, since August, because on the Facebook page for Broadsheet New Zealand's Feminist Magazine, we have come out totally clearly um, on what we would call a feminist position. But the trans ideologues they do engage totally in double speak, so it doesn't really matter what we say, they will take the same language and use it against us. So when you're talking about the um, UN, UN Declaration on Children's Rights, the responsible treatment of children, they will turn that up and down, and the violence they use, and now the exclusionary practices against lesbian groups. Um, how, there's two things. We don't understand where this trans movement came from, I mean, it seemed as though it probably was working for about five or ten years and we didn't know, but it burst into public awareness after gay and lesbian marriage, we thought. Um, and we thought, oh, trans rights, that's fair, they don't have, you know, that's their turn. And it turned out to be something completely different. The funding of it, I'm very curious about if you have any understanding, and the messaging is the same globally. And the words keep coming out of individuals' mouths, even on the UN staff Facebook page today. If you can throw any light, and I wasn't interested in the strategy for the declaration, we need uh, tools fast for New Zealand because the proposal is going to go quickly there. Thank you. So, the questioner is from New Zealand and saying that. Um, Feminist women of the older generations had barely known that there was a self-ID proposal in the works that was the same as is in the UK. And I, I would note a similar proposal is being advanced here in the US called the Equality Act that has all of the same self-ID provisions that would roll it out nationally. Um, well, the Equality Act is, is uh, the, US, the US law that was just reintroduced this past week. Um, and she was saying that it doesn't matter what they say, they're just as abusive um, in pushing back. And she wants to know where this came from, uh, where the funding is coming from, and that it seems like the messaging is the same globally, and where, where is that coming from? Well, one of the things about where does the money come from and the power and the force of all of this, I don't know what the lesbian and gay rights organisations in New Zealand are, but there must be some. Actually, gay men's rights, because there's never anything to do with women, and now trans rights. The, the problem is that, uh, particularly after gay marriage, I think a lot of gay rights organisations, I should call them advisedly, thought, where do we go from here? Apparently we've got everything and we're not going to get any funding anymore unless we find something new. Well, they found something new and they're getting massively funded now on trans rights. And that's the case with Stonewall, which was the main lesbian and gay organisation in Britain after gay marriage, where do you go? 
they went to trans rights and have become completely a trans rights organization. They really don't do anything anymore. They certainly don't do anything for lesbians. Lesbians are just leaving it, stopping funding it, becoming absolutely furious. So, uh, and indeed there are um, men who are, pretend to be women who are running lesbian and gay organizations in the States. They're heterosexual and they're running lesbian and gay organizations. So it's, um, it's about the money, it's about the money. Uh, it's, it's corrupt because they're promoting something that's totally against all of our interests, but they want to continue getting their funding. In fact, the woman running Stonewall has recently um, had to, st uh, to stand down as a result of the heat she was getting on this from feminists. So you need to be looking at the organizations, looking at exactly what they're saying, looking at who's funding them and where the money's coming from. The money obviously is coming from um, some um, um, extremely rich billionaires who are actually tra um, transgender, they're cross-dressers and they're pouring money into this, but there's also some who shall be nameless who are not even cross-dressers, who are very, very rich men who are pouring money into this, liberal men. The same ones who are asking for all the other men's rights, that is to have legally available prostitution, probably in state-run brothels and so on. I mean, that's it's the men who are funding all of men's rights who are also funding this. Um, so, yes, no, women didn't know, but it's been going on since at least the 90s, which is why I talked about the International Bill of Gender Rights in America. Those men were getting organized and putting this forward. I think uh, feminists thought it's nothing to do with us, and it's indeed nothing to do with women. Why should we worry? And they didn't look. 2004, there was the Gender Recognition Act in Britain, which shows how powerful these organizations have been up to then. Feminists were not asked to contribute. They thought nothing of it. They made no comments. I was watching from Australia as that legislation went through. I was completely horrified. Not a single feminist in Britain said a word about that legislation. So yes, feminists were absolutely asleep and had no idea what any of this meant. But it's been going on for about 20 years now. They're pretty organized. But also they're organized in a way unimaginable to us which is they are advising the police, they're advising the girl guides, they're going into schools, they've got huge numbers of lobbyists advising government in a way that's extraordinary. I mean, there was a meeting in Britain um, for them, a, st a strategy meeting by some of these um, transgender organisations to work out what to do, and the um, deputy minister, uh, equalities minister, was there from the Labour Party in Britain, and they were, make, no, they were, they were uh, making fun of transphobic feminists and working out what they were going to do next, which is where do you plant people, exactly where do you need to have influence. They've got the money, they've got the workers. It's on an extraordinary scale. Feminists are in no position to compete, we have no funding, we have no workers, and we had no idea what was going on. So yes, this is absolutely massive, and it's been going on a bit under the radar, not because it was secret, but because feminists until this point didn't think that they had to think about it. I think that's seriously the situation. Um, I, I think that's true. I think, I don't know how useful it is to know what's been happening in the UK, for people here, but there's definitely been a turning of the tide in a lot of ways in, in, in the last few months in the UK. The um, in regard to feminist organising, um, that there was a massive radicalisation, I think, after the assault on Miriam Hopkins. An awful lot of women really realised what this lobby was about and what these activists were about and how misogynist and violent they were. And there was already a groundswell happening once the recommendations for gender self-ID had been made, and women tried to meet to discuss them and were constantly threatened. Their news were threatened. They were found <coughs> uh, um, to get their news closed down, often successfully, although women's groups still managed to get alternative venues. When they got the venues, they were trans activists, not necessarily always trans, but their supporters outside, sometimes in masks, blocking women's way in to buildings. There was, there was the, the physical assault on Maria, and a lot of women became radicalized through that which I think is one of the reasons why there is such a massive now um, fight back in, in the UK against self-ID. And then the Karen White case, when White was placed in a women's prison and assaulted two women there, a lot of the newspapers and other media reported that even newspapers who previously had had a totally pro-trans position, like the, the left-wing news, the main left-wing newspaper in the UK, The Guardian, where it's impossible to get any, any gender-critical um, Articles in uh, according to you know the, there was nothing in there. Even they started um, writing articles that were more questioning, and I think there has been a turnaround. 
and the, the sports debate yeah. as well, which I think is international, especially since Martina Navratilova spoke yeah. out, that has made a big impact. So gradually, looking back over the last 18 months, there have been various events that have happened that have radicalised women, and the more women have become radicalised, the more that they've done. Some journalists, um, usually in the more right-wing newspapers initially, not very right-wing at the Times, which is right to the right of centre, but not an extreme right newspaper. As there's, a, there's a female journalist on the Times who um, has published quite a lot of articles, and there have there been, there been more right-wing uh, publications as well, uh, which have published, and now some of the more left publications are starting to publish some critical um, material, because I think they've realised, particularly after the Karen White case, they couldn't continue with this totally one-sided approach, although by and large the mainstream media, and certainly the BBC, with the occasional exception, um, are very pro-trans in their approach, but things are changing. So the more feminists have pushed, um, and feminists have made a big effort to, you know, be in contact with, with sympathetic journalists in the UK and try to push for articles and so on, that it has, it did start to work. Oh, what did you say? Um, our minister, just a few days ago while we were here in New York, our minister has said that they're backpedalling on the self ID with um, transit. They're going to go for our government minister for equalities in the UK. It was all going to be for self ID, and now she said, no, no, we're going to concentrate on rights for trans people, and we're going to stop the self ID. So that's a big going on um, at the Tavistock Clinic in that people are actually resigning in relation to this, this issue. Important people. Director, a director resigned, the director of this clinic resigned over this particular it's, I'd rather not say too much about it. This is, going, this is being recorded. Um, but uh, yes, he was vilified though. He was vilified from within the Tavistock. It's very political what's going on at the moment. Let's just see what transpires. Um, but the fact that the very centre of the Gender Identity Development Services for Children is in a state of internal conflict at the moment, with some people resigning, um, means that something very, a, a deep change is about to happen, I think, which is great. But. The question I asked something, I, I've forgotten now, we've spoken so much since then, something about the money, where it's all coming from, and these kinds of things. The money is really important, as Sheila has said. Obviously, it's really, really important. But to get back to the philosophical concept has also been important of gender identity. That has allowed, that is a concept, there is no such thing as a gender identity, it's a feeling, you can have a feeling. Anybody can identify with whatever they want, but it doesn't make it a material reality. The fact that that concept has just been shot through bit by bit, bit by bit, our language has been so powerful. Language is really important as to how we think about things. So if you substitute gender for sex, your, you know, and if that becomes acceptable, your battles are, are, are almost won for you, which is where the importance of the declaration lies. The declaration that we've written is because it reverses that. It points out that all the different various stages in the law, as it were, that you know, sex and gender need to be distinguished from each other. So, um, it, I think it's a really important document that's been written, personally. Yeah. I just wanted to comment briefly about the money and 
sort of the structure of it. It's certainly the case in the U.S., and I don't know how much this is in other countries, but I've seen it with, like, Stonewall taking out this metro ad with, like, 100 different companies and government agencies in support of gender identity just this past year. But one of the, one of the functions of charitable organizations in the U.S., especially the very large national name brands, has become to do sort of, like, nonprofit corporate PR. You sponsor the organization and it gives you a good mark and it helps deflect negative attention for other things that you might do, like, you know, you're, you're supplying bombs to some terrible war in another country, but oh look, you have gender neutral bathrooms. And <laughs> so the, part of the function of organizations like the Human Rights Campaign is to release like, you know, 100 best employer lists for LGBT people in the US. And so, like, companies want to be on the, these lists, they want to be spoken of favorably, so they'll join in things like boycotting the entire state of North Carolina over the right of men to use women's single sex facilities. It costs them nothing. What does it cost them? It costs them nothing. They get PR, they get good marks, they get a favorable write-up in the newspaper with a very trendy, popular cause, because it's not just trendy for teenagers, it's also trendy in Hollywood, it's trendy in a lot of shows like this generation's Saved by the Bell shows, like if you're an American who's roughly my age, you know what that is, that's like, you know, whatever, whatever the current show is about being, a, you know, an awkward high school student, there's a trans storyline in that show. And so it's, it's the popular done thing also for these corporations. And so like the 161 corporations that came out supporting the Equality Act, which is our self-ID act, they all get a favorable write-up for that. They get favorable presentation. They get, you know, marquee, this, this company is great for human rights. And again, costs them nothing except taking away women's rights. And who cares about that? They're not going to be held to account for that in the press or really by anybody. And their donations keep these organizations going. And that's another kind of like just, it's bigger than just this particular charity structure, but it's definitely a factor. So uh, we had another question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, about this huge agenda, I didn't hear you mention any figures on the exploitation of women and how they're under, under prostitution, but I guess it's there in the declaration. I mean, how most of them are women and, and girls, not exploited in prostitution. I, I don't know if it's, it's included in the declaration. Uh, but what I wanted to say is this all seems part of a, a much bigger picture of um, a huge agenda to take away all the legal issues that will um, constrain men from using and abusing women's, women and girls' bodies, basically, as objects or something they can use. So we have pornography, we have surrogacy, sometimes even abortion. I mean, we have all these different, they're funded by the same people, by the same industries, the beauty industry, the pharmaceutical industry, um, the drugs, I mean, comparing us to drugs, so we decriminalize uh, marijuana as we decriminalize sex. And, and also conflating, I mean, creating this new gen, um, identity which is sex work. They're trying to sell us the idea that sex workers are also born sex workers. It's an identity, or they choose this gender identity to be a sex worker. No? So I think it's all part of a much larger picture, and we need to connect all the dots. We cannot just have Take only the transgender. I mean, this is huge. And so making them visible, I mean, this is not human rights. Going back to the state's commitments, I think we need to go back to international law, and we need to get rid of these multimillionaire funding of the human rights movement. I mean, we lost government aid, aid um, or uh, <coughs> Funding and so everybody's going to Soros, everybody's going to OSF or to Bill Gates, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to get their funding to do human rights. So if they have to keep quiet about some things to get money to do the other things, they 
Even nuns are doing this. I mean, they're saying, I mean, nuns who were traditionally helping women in prostitution now think it's a liberal thing to, I mean, if they're there, maybe they want to be there. No, and they've been working with it for 200 years, but they know the, the violence that's there. So making them, I mean, we, we need to be connecting the dots and we need to get our act done before they do. Before government, CEDO, international, I mean, human rights conventions. We cannot leave it, I mean, in <coughs> one declaration, I mean, we really need to go to state parties, I think. Um, the, the live stream uh, question was commenting that um, the whole thing seems to take away from an agenda of fighting the exploitation of women and girls, and that the same uh, groups are also selling a uh, sex worker as a born identity, as something innate, um, and speaking about the, the need for getting multi-millionaire funding out of the human rights movement and establishing stronger international law. Did any of you want to comment on that, or should we? Um, when you're talking about joining the dots, um, I think that there are certain, there is all kinds of things happening that women are not necessarily joining up at the moment. Uh, one of those things, for instance, is we're being groomed as a culture, groomed to accept the transgendering of children and the abuse of children. For instance, you will find, especially if you're in an English-speaking country, that in your local library there is drag queen story time. Yeah. Now, drag queen, when you look at the websites of these, this is sex industry, these are mostly prostituted men, men in pornography, they're called things like La Whore, W-H-O-R-E, or Miss Beaver, meaning women's genitals. These are the men who are going into the schools. If you look at their websites, uh, you will often find that they are funded by all kinds of organizations, and of course, the library is taking them in that you need to be able to trust your local library. In fact, these men who are looking absolutely hideous and often absolutely frightening with sort of terrible, uh, frightening makeup on their faces are in there reading to two and three year old children books about how you can change sex. Now, this is extraordinary. We don't know about this. I mean, how many of you knew about and had thought about Drag Queen Storytime? I mean, yep, the, the very few. And probably very few are involved in protesting against it in, in, in this country. In, Aus in America, the only ones protesting against it are in some places churches. Feminists are not. They are not aware of what's going on. But that's just one example. There's, there's sites in Britain, websites of trans health organizations that run training workshops for binding. That is for little girls, binding. Supported by the NHS, the National Health Service. That name is on who is supporting them. Yes. So we've got this extraordinary grooming of a culture where at the moment we're not even knowing what's happening and being able to join up all the dots that are going on. But we really need to be doing that. It's just all gone so far beyond what we can imagine. Um, to answer your question, the Declaration doesn't explicitly discuss sexual exploitation. It discusses um, the, 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 the initial emphasis for it was to develop a document which would challenge uh, gender identity ideology and that's its main focus but it also um, talks about women's reproductive integrity and includes sections on surrogacy, on the um, basically maternal rights and mother's rights and I, I agree with you that they're all connected up but we, we couldn't include every single aspect of women's oppression in one document it's quite a long document as it is. Um, so I think that there, I think there is scope for working in the human rights field in, on the existing the Paloma Protocol and all of, and, and the other um, documents relating to sexual exploitation. In the early days, um, a lot of those documents were based on the idea that prostitution was inherently exploitative of women, and this, the, the so-called sex work lobby has, 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 has been challenging that, and the idea of sex work has been creeping in. And maybe then, yeah, this equally needs to be a pushback against that. We, I think we need to see the links between all of it. But it's very difficult to fight all of it on one front. I mean, I think there's lots of different fronts we have to try and fight it on. But that's the reason why it's not. It just would have been impossible to include everything in that one document. I'll just say that we as a do um, join up the Doxby campaign on porn, prostitution, sex encounter venues, surrogacy, and transgender, as well as the things like the Bale and FGM. 
So if you are if you feel that as soon as Grenada Farms is in one area, then the fight back in the other area. So we absolutely agree with you. We must um, join up the dots. We've got our website on there. Please get in touch. Hi, um, so I've been watching all the people announcing their prospective candidacy for president in 2020, and a lot of the candidates, different groups will give their human rights council or campaign score. Is it safe to assume if they have a 100% rating, then that means that they are replaced, then it's replaced up by their rate for sense in Title IX and as far as I understand it, um, here in the U.S., the Democratic Caucus in both houses is pretty much unanimously in favor of the Equality Act with the gender identity provisions included in it. I haven't heard of anyone who has come out and said that they don't support it. So I think if they are like a sitting member of Congress, then I think it's safe to assume that they, they do support that, yes, with like a 100% rating from like the HRC or one of these yeah. other groups, I'm sure that they do support it. I imagine it would be a huge news story if one of them said that they don't believe that humans can change sex. I know that's Bernie Sanders Because women are not discriminated against for wearing dresses. 
the very idea is ridiculous. In order to acknowledge the sex stereotype based discrimination that they face, you have to acknowledge sex. But if you did that, and if we were having an honest national conversation about that, that sex stereotype discrimination language is in the bill. It's the gender identity provisions that basically erase it, that undo everything for women. Okay, so part of it's okay, but it's that part that needs to go. Yes, it's that part that needs to go. And we have one more, or? Okay, I, I, we, we have to, to call time and, and be done. I'm sorry. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this has been wonderful.